All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, once again. Um, this talk is Break the Cycle, Three Excellent Python Tools to Automate Repetitive talks, uh, Tasks. Um. <laughs> Session chairs can sometimes have a little bit of a stage fright, too. Um, uh, so the speaker is uh, Thea Flowers, and uh, she has requested uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, please hold them off uh, until the end of the talk, and you can see her outside in the hall, where she will be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. So without further ado, uh, Thea. Hi, there are a lot of you. <laughs> I'm very nervous. Um, I'm Thea, and I'm going to talk to you today about three excellent Python tools that I like to use to automate repetitive tasks. Before we get started, I want to tell you what to expect from this talk. We only have like 30 minutes together here today. It's a very short amount of time, and there's a lot of things that I want to tell you about. So we're not going to do any like super big, deep dives into any of these tools. My goal here is to kind of give you a taste of these tools, to give you an idea of what they are, how they look, how they work, and inspire you to go check them out. I'm also going to be pretty focused on tasks related to working on or maintaining a Python project. There's at least one tool out of these three that can be used outside of that context, but it's going to be largely focused on that sort of thing. Another thing to keep in mind is that I'm going to show some code samples, and I'm going to show some output from these tools. But my goal here isn't to like, teach you what this code does or have you fully understand it or anything like that. I just to give you an idea of what it looks like to use these tools. So don't sweat it if you can't like, read all the code, if you're all the way in the back standing up there because this room is very full, which isn't scary at all. Um, <laughs> Just know that the slides will be published online. You can go dig it into them later. Um, they're all pretty straightforward samples. Cool. And also, some of you will probably be familiar with the first tool I talk about, but I promise the later two are going to be really interesting for you. And like I mentioned, what I want you to take away is just this inspiration to go check out these tools and maybe automate some of the things in your life. So I want to start this talk with story time. So, and not a fun story, though, <laughs> unfortunately. A story of frustration. This is one that's really common to me, and hopefully it'll resonate with a few of you. Um, let's imagine that you have just come back from work, back to work, not from work, back to work, from like a long weekend or a holiday, or you've decided that you want to contribute to an open source project for the first time. Really cool stuff. You're excited, and you clone the code, you have it locally, and you're like, cool, before I go breaking stuff, let's run the test. It's a great idea. Always make sure things still work before you go breaking things. The problem is you can't just do that. The world that we've made for ourselves means that we can't just simply run the test. So this story, this scenario I'm going to walk you through, is what goes through my mind when I have to run the test for a project. So, the first thing we have to do, step zero, is create a virtual environment because you don't want to run all this project stuff in your global Python environment and install its dependencies and mess up all your versions and end up with version conflicts because that's never fun. So virtual environment. The problem is I haven't used virtual environment in a few days because I've been on holiday and I forgot the commands. So let's Google, let's Google the virtual commands. So this is the top Google result for virtual environment. And it's really dense. You'll notice there's not any commands here. This is wonderfully useful if you want to know what virtual environment does under the covers. It's completely useless if you want to know how to use virtual environment. Um, thankfully, there's a user's guide on the left side there. And that has the two commands kind of spaced out a little bit that we need. So cool. I can do that now, so let's make a virtual environment. Cool. So I, in this sample, I've made a virtual environment. 
and I've activated it. It's two steps, actually. Step zero has part A and B. Cool. Now, what were we doing? Oh, we're running the test. Let's run test. But how do I run the test again? Um, I could look at the readme. I could look wherever. I could guess. Um, I think it's PyTest. So let's just try running PyTest, right? That makes sense. Um, oh, man. PyTest isn't installed. And I also would like to point out, this is an error message from Ubuntu. And it tells you to install this completely unrelated package. So <laughs> don't do that. But we're not in trouble yet, right? I mean, we know that PyTest is a Python thing. So we can just pip install that, right? Sounds like a good plan. Pip install PyTest. Yay, there's green finally somewhere in this. So we installed PyTest. Yay, another step. Um, so let's try running it again, right? We have it now. We can run it. Oh, great, more red. Um, so it seems like I'm missing a dependency. I'm missing Flask is what it's called out here. But I'm almost completely certain that if I just went and installed Flask, that I would be missing some other dependency and some other dependency. Thankfully, I think this project has a requirements.txt. So there can't be any traps there, right? <laughs> um, so let's just pip install requirements.txt, right? That's easy. We're Python developers. We know how to do this. Oh, crap. What did I do? See, this happens to me every time I pip install requirements.txt. If you know the problem, raise your hand. I forgot the dash r. So it's pip install dash r requirements.txt. And at this point, my excitement over working on this project is quickly waning. Like, fine. OK. So got a dependencies installed. Let's try third time's a charm. Let's try running PyTest. Yay. It finally worked. But at what cost? <laughs> well, we had to do a lot of stuff to get here. Like, Lots and lots of silly like, steps here. We had to go and do all this stuff. And it might seem like to some of you folks who are like super advanced Python developers, you're like, Thea, this is trivial stuff. I do this 17 times a day, sometimes more than twice an hour. And <laughs> it may seem trivial, but for people who are either newer to Python or coming from other languages or or whatever, or just coming into your project, these steps are potential points that you can lose people. And people are the most important part of software, so let's try to be kind to people. This stuff is toil. Toil is all the nonsense that you have to go through to get to what you actually want to do, which was run PyTest. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to run the test. The Witches and Macbeth mentioned toil and trouble in the same breath, and I promise that you want nothing to do with what they're cooking up. So this whole talk is about being kind to yourself and to your teammates and contributors and trying to reduce some of this toil in your life. This is what I'm about. So let's talk about how we can fix this. The first tool I want to talk about is Tox, and it might be very familiar to a lot of you. It's been around for quite some time, and it's basically the gold standard for this use case. Tox aims to standardize Python testing, which is a very lofty goal, and they've kind of succeeded at it. Um, it uses a, any file as its configuration, and it makes this scenario really, really simple because if you're a Python developer and you check out a project and it has a tox.any, you know immediately that you could probably just run tox and you'll get to what you want to do. That's one step. Let's, let's take a look at what that looks like. So, OK, this is a simple tox.any file. Again, like I said, don't try to digest this whole thing. It's an any file. It just tells tox to do some things. In this case, it tells tox to do the same steps we did, all those manual steps. I'm going to highlight some things here. So this first highlighted section is where it installed those dependencies I talked about earlier. And this second highlighted section is where it runs run PyTest. You can see at the bottom there's green, and green is good. So Yay. It took all of those toilful steps, got rid of them for us, and made just one step. That's wonderful. It's a huge win for everyone involved. But this isn't Tox's real strength here. Automation is power. 
Because Tox makes all of this stuff trivial, it actually makes it possible for you to test multiple Python environments, which is really, really cool. So imagine, just imagine, I know this is gonna be difficult for y'all. Imagine it's 2019 and you're still dealing with Python 2 and 3. <laughs> well, Tox can help. I have highlighted a one line, well, not even really a one line change, a four character change in the tox.any file. And now when you run it, this is gonna be very hard to see, but you'll notice there's two green stripes across the screen. That means it ran PyTest twice. It ran it once for Python 2.7 and once for Python 3.7. And this is wonderful. I didn't have to do anything extra really to get that. You kind of get it for free. Um, so that's like the really powerful part of this tool. Another scenario you might be able to imagine if you write plugins or packages or anything like that is that you need to test against multiple versions of a dependency. Um, especially those of us who develop Django um, extensions and Flask extensions need to do this. So this little example tests against Python 2.7, Python 3.7, Flask 0.12, and Flask 1.02. Um, I really couldn't find better version numbers, I'm sorry. But this actually does four runs of PyTest because it multiplies it. It runs the two different versions of Flask in both Python 2.7 and 3.7. That's really, really awesome. So, Tox is everywhere. You can throw a rock and hit 17 or 18 projects that use Tox. If you throw a bunch of rocks, you'll find hundreds. Um, it is, it's been used for a long time, and if you decide to start your automation journey with Tox, you'll find lots of examples, lots of support, lots of resources. So it's a good thing to keep in mind. However, Tox is a really focused tool. It is very, very good at what it does. It is mostly intended for automating Python packages, and that is things that can be pip installed. So things that have a setup.py or pyproject.toml, and it can be used for things like web apps, but it takes a little bit of, of telling for that. You have to tell it how to deal with that. But it's really good at the package idea. You can use it for things like building documentation as well, but the further you stray from Tox's sort of intended purpose, the more inflexible it becomes. So that is to say, if your automation is like hammering nails, Tox is a pneumatic nail gun. It'll make it happen real fast with very little effort, um, and that's awesome. So Tox is wonderful, but what if you want to do more? What if your automation needs to deal with all kinds of stuff? So the next tool I want to talk about is Knox. I know it sounds really similar. It definitely wasn't intentional. Um, full disclosure, I am the original creator of Knox. Um, but I love Tox and Knox and the last tool that I'm going to talk about too. So they're all, they're all my loves. So Knox aims for flexible test automation. It is a spiritual sibling to Tox. They are sort of intended to solve similar problems. Like Tox, it uses a configuration file, but unlike Tox, its configuration file is Python. So let's see what that looks like. Easier to show than tell. This is a simple Knox file. If you've used Flask, and Flask is a sort of use of decorators to define um, view functions, it's uh, very similar to that. So we have like a Knox session. And this session does the same thing we did with Tox before. It creates a virtual environment, installs requirements, runs PyTest. Boom. It's pretty much the same stuff. Easy peasy. Just like Tox, Knox can handle the whole matrix thing of testing multiple versions of dependencies and different Python interpreter versions. Um, Knox calls this parameterization. It borrowed that term from PyTest. So if you're, if you're familiar with PyTest's parameterization, you'll be right at home with this. And just like with Tox, it spits out four different invocations and all that stuff. So I know what you're thinking at this point. So what? Like, does, this, does the same thing as Tox, why would I use it? Well, good question, but I have an answer. 
Python as configuration is magical. Being able to just use Python as configuration for your automation is a really, really freeing thing. Like, I assume that you're in this room because you have some vague interest in Python. So you already know basically 99% of how to use Knox. You just need to learn very small things, a very small API. So let's, let me show some more examples of things going beyond this. Imagine you're working with protocol buffers, or don't, I don't care. Um, just imagine that you're dealing with something that has like a source file, a proto file in this case, and it needs to be compiled into a Python file. And you could sit here and add an entry to your Knox file or Tox file for every single proto file you have, and that's probably gonna become really tedious really fast. Or you can use Python's glob module, which does pattern matching like shells do, and you can find star.proto, so you can find all the proto files, and then just pass them into the, the compiler all at once. So this one just does two files, because I didn't want the output to be crazy, but it's much easier that way. This next sample is one of my favorites. This is in every project I have that uses Knox. Um, how many of you build docs? Have used Sphinx? Cool, all right, a little less than half, that's fine. Sphinx is a tool that builds documentation. It, you run it, it spits out a bunch of HTML files, and then you have to go and like serve that <laughs> and then browse to it in your browser. So what this example does is if you just run Knox as normal, it will do that. It'll build the documentation to build slash HTML. And then what you'd normally do is you go and you'd CD into build slash HTML, you'd run python dash m HTTP dot server, I think. Um, and then you'd browse to localhost 5000, I think. Um, so there's steps involved. But Knox has a superpower because it can do Knox docs serve. And what it'll do is instead of just using Sphinx, It'll use Sphinx auto build, which does this magic of building the docs, starting a web server, opening your browser for you automatically, and then watching for changes and automatically reloading your browser. That is awesome. <laughs> like that's the kind of experience I want people to have when they're trying to contribute to my documentation, is it should be really, really easy. So Knox is for automation of Python projects. It is more flexible than Tox. Um, but also less focused. So it has pros and cons. It's a really great choice for things like Python applications, especially web applications that tend to have a lot of peripheral tasks that need to be done. I've seen Knox used in some really interesting ways. For example, Google Cloud Platform has like 200 odd sample applications, and it became pretty tedious for them to maintain individual like test configuration for each one. So they actually use Knox to discover the sample applications and generate sessions for each sample and run them all. So instead of having 200 odd Knox or Tox configuration files, they just have one, which is really, really cool. So what if Knox still isn't enough? What if you're like, Thea, that's cool, but I have way bigger needs than that. What if you are not actually working in a Python project and you want to use Python to do the task? Okay, cool. We can use Invoke for that. Invoke is a really, really cool tool that I discovered about a year ago. It's been around for longer than that, but it's really, really great. Invoke is a task execution tool and library. It takes inspiration from things like GNU Make, Ruby's Rake, and like other stuff that I forgot. Fabric because it's from the same creator as Fabric. Um, it's really, really flexible. And it makes a lot less assumptions than the other tools that I talked about. So it lets you do more. So I'm gonna show you some really simple examples really real quick. So Tox has this thing about environments, that's its high level concept. Knox has this thing about sessions, that's its high level concept. And they're very interchangeable. But with Invoke, you have task, which is a much more general thing. So you have task-based workflows. These are two simple tasks that basically delete the, they clean the docs build, so they delete any old HTML, and then build it. And the two separate tasks where they have dependencies. So when you run them, it actually cleans the, the build output first and then runs the thing. I mean, you could definitely do this with Knox and Tox. It's just 
illustrate it. Don't, don't worry about it. We'll get into some really cool stuff here in a second. So Invoke is this tool framework. It's kind of superficially similar to the other tools here, but it's kind of a horse of a different color. You could write tasks that do the same thing as knocks and talks, sure. Um, but it's really better for things beyond that. What I find myself doing is using talks and knocks for the Python testing aspect of my projects, and then using Invoke to handle the maintenance minutia. So let's talk about that. So this is from PIP. Are you all familiar with PIP? Yeah? Talked about it earlier in this talk. Um, PIP, they have a lot of contributors. And they used to have this problem where they'd ask contributors to manually add themselves to the author's file so they get attribution for their work, which is really a nice thing to do. The problem is we kept forgetting to do that. What this does, and this is super simplified, PIP's actual task is a little bit more complicated. This uses Git to just find all the, the authors by their, by their commits and then compiles an author's file for us. So this is an example output, but this way we can run this as part of a release process and we don't have to worry about leaving anybody behind. That's really cool. Another one that I use all the time is I release a lot of packages and when you release packages, it's nice to put together a change log to tell people what changed between the versions. I mean, you don't have to, but it's a nice thing to do. So what this task does is it uses Git to actually figure out the difference between the last release and the current release and prints it out in a nice format that can be easily copied and pasted into a change log. Of course, you could take this concept even further and have Invoke actually update the change log file for you there's an idea. Or even further, and have Invoke just automate the entire release process for you. That's an idea, but that's for a different talk, I think. So you can also do really fun stuff. Don't try to wrap your head around this. Please don't. Um, this is a, <laughs> an Invoke example that compiles a C program, um, and it does actually compile. And I actually pulled this from my personal experience because I do a lot of Arduino stuff, and I hate using make, and I hate the Arduino IDE, so I can build them with a command line using invoke, which is great, so I don't have to write make scripts, and I don't have to deal with the Arduino IDE. So you can do that. You can even build C projects with it if you really want to. Invoke is for everything, basically. It's a tool that lets you build any variety of task-based workflows. It's super awesome. It's not gonna do anything for you. It's not gonna make assumptions. It'll do like argument parsing and stuff, but It'll just give you the primitives to build whatever you need to build. Cool? All right, that's a lot. I threw a lot at you real fast. I'm showing you three tools that I like to use, but let's wrap it up. I like to think of these tools as like a gradient of sorts. On one end, you have really opinionated, focused tools like Tox. Towards the middle, but still not really, you have less opinionated and more flexible tools like Knox. And then towards the very other end, you have really, really flexible tools that don't really make a lot of decisions for you, like Invoke. So hopefully these have inspired you to go and reduce some toil in your life. Hopefully one of these tools is useful to you in your day-to-day -day life. If not, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, don't know how to, I don't know how to make you happy in that case. Um, but yeah, finally, thank you for coming to my talk. If you would like to learn more about these tools, please go check them out on GitHub. Um, if you'd like to learn more about me or ask me questions about these tools or how I use them or uh, talk to me about synthesizers or whatever, you can get in touch with me. You can go to my website. You can stalk me on Twitter. That's cool, too. But thank you.